Thank you all for coming out. And thanks to the bookstore for opening itself again to us, uh, to Woody, who's such a help. Uh, the first reader of the two that I'd like to introduce is the outgoing poet laureate, Tish Perlman. And I'd just like to read a few things about her. She's a poet, broadcast journalist, and political activist originally from Manhattan Beach, California. She is host of the award-winning public radio interview show, Out of Bounds. Her poetry chapbook, The Fix is In, which retold her harrowing 2009 near-death a heart surgery experience was published by Finishing Line Press in January 2012. Her newest collection, Afterlife, was published by Foothills Publishers in May 2014, aptly named. Her most recent work has appeared in The Healing Muse, Earth's Daughters, Conversations Across Borders. She was the 2013-2014 Poet Laureate of Tompkins County, New York. She lives in Ithaca, New York, and has lived here for the last 15 years and she's been resting on her laureates for two years. <laughs> Please welcome Tish Perlman. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for all coming out on this beautiful day. Um, I'm, at least it's not snowing or none of us would be here. So, um, I'm, I, It's an honor for me to, to, to pass the baton to Jack. It's, uh, the last two years have, have been an absolutely magical time for me. I, um, I did many things, but two of the highlights were um, giving a, a talk and doing a reading at Elmira College last year, where I met some incredible young women. It gave me hope for the future. They were politically astute. They loved poetry. They, some of them wanted to be writers. And so they took me to lunch, and, and we sat and talked about politics and about, about my work as a, as a journalist. And it, it was just an, a, a magical experience. And my other highlight from, from the laureateship was to be the keynote speaker at the Finger Lakes Women's Bar Association dinner. So I, I was asked to, to talk about my radio show and to give a poetry reading. So um, having a bunch of lawyers and judges trapped in a room <laughs> where you can give them a poetry reading was, was an absolutely amazing moment. And um, so, so, so I, I, I leave this event to great applause, which I was surprised by, and I was happy I didn't get a lawsuit. So the, the applause <laughs> probably meant that I, that I did the right thing. Um, so so um, many of you have heard me read, and, and you know that I started writing again in 2009 um, after a 20-plus year silence. I, I stopped writing after my mother died, and I, I didn't pick it up again until this heart surgery experience, which was harrowing, and I never expected to write again, but I, I died during the surgery. And as I've told people through the years, I, I came back with poetry, and it was a total surprise to me, and I thought it was just going to be a, you know, a, a situational thing, and I wrote the, the chat book, and, and there are a lot more poems that weren't in that book, but I was just writing, almost like Sylvia Plath did during the last m months of her life, just crazily writing two or three poems a day. And I thought that would be it. You know, I got it published, I was able to talk about it, but the poems keep coming, they continue to surface, and now I've been writing about my childhood and about my, my life in Southern California. I was brought up on the beach in Southern California and about my politics and my travels. And so the poems just keep on coming. So I am not going to complain about it. I'm going to continue writing. And I will read you some of the poems from the new book. I won't read from the, the chat book today. It's, it's, if anybody's interested, they have it here. And, and you can buy it if you want to. But I, I don't really need to revisit that at this moment in this beautiful spring atmosphere. So I'm going to read you some of my poems from um, Afterlife. And this one is called, the first one's called The Drive Home. And, this is reminiscent of, we used to go visit the cousins in Burbank, California, and drive home along the coast. And so I, I, I just started thinking about that, and I wrote this poem about it. The Drive Home. We would meet the night with simplicity, slipping into half-sleep by the roar of the car engine, carrying us into the late hour, city lights twinkling and dissolving, and then the blackness and moon shimmering of the sea. We trace the miles to home with the radio purring, weather reports, news, and rock music. Jarred awake when the engine died, signaling arrival. The foggy sea air whispers the clicking of keys and of lights. A day banished, prayer. Now I lay me down. Childhood is half awake as it tries on the world. And the world is indifferent as it lures the child toward no known destination, deep sleep, the long night. 
my mother was an alcoholic and she died of lung cancer, cancer at the age of 59. And she was an unhappy woman. She, she, you know, she, she was brought up in Hollywood. She wanted to be a singer and she ended up getting married and doing all the things that, that women were supposed to do in, in, in that era. Uh, she died in 1982. She was born in 1922. So um, this is a poem I wrote about her, Memories of Our Childhood with our, with our Mother. Memories in Blue. I send my mind into the past and find my mother sitting alone on the couch, drink in hand, humming into the silence. What was she longing for? Not much time left then. Fingers tapping, her pain still visible in the distance. The voices of children perhaps awaked, awakened some other moment in her. When she was a child once dreaming, a young woman holding her own child. My mother is in shadow. She is bigger than life in her longing and her singing and her loneliness. I send my mind into the past and find her in the Hollywood High School yearbook saying she'll go into radio singing in her future. But she meets another path. Another life grabs her right there as she passes. Now I see her smile, see her curled in her corner on the worn burgundy couch, singing Judy Garland songs late at night while her children slept, dreaming of her. So far away, singing into the emptiness, as if the emptiness were listening. I, when I showed that to my brother, he got really upset about it. <laughs> and I, I can understand why. Um, our mother was fun when she wasn't drinking, and, and, and she loved us and took care of us. But, you know, I would say she probably was bipolar at this point. A few years ago, I started looking into my mother's family, mainly they were Dutch and Irish. And I started thinking about what it felt like to come here as an immigrant and, and come to a new land. And so I wrote this poem after I, after I did some of this research. It's called In the Distance. I sense a homesickness for a place hidden inside my marrow, a lighthouse with the eyes of my ancestors longing for a glimpse of landfall. I know I have wandered the lush fields of Ireland and felt the spray of the North Sea off the coast of the Netherlands on the lookout for a new world in a time that does not change. I am homesick for a place I never inhabited, on a pilgrimage deep inside the landscape of stillness. An age long past sleeps in me, ghosting my skin. So that, you know, I, I found out that I had a great, great, great grandfather that was in the Civil War. And, you know, everybody who looks into their background find fascinating stories. Um, when I was a kid, we used to go to a place called Crestline. It was near Big Bear. Um, it was about an hour and a half or so from, from Los Angeles. And we used to go to a place called Lake Gregory. And when, when I was a kid, and I didn't even remember this until one morning I woke up. I usually write about five in the morning. And I remembered that this girl drowned at Crestline when I was about 10 or 12. And they kept trying to shelter us and keep us away from her, but I wanted to go see what was happening. So, so this, this memory was called up somehow at five in the morning and I wrote this. It, it was published in The Healing Muse two years ago. It's called The Drowned Girl. Meet me there near where the undertow meets the body, locked in tossing currents. Where is horizon? Where is shore? Tumbling. I recall the drowned girl. She was a Mexican, they all whispered. Visiting Lake Gregory, not one of us. Probably couldn't swim, they all whispered. Lost her way. I could have been her, about my age, gelatinous substance on her mouth, her long dark hair cascading, lying limp on the sand. A crowd gathered, almost a dream that summer memory. And afterward, we went back to our towels, soaked in the sun, swam in the lake, never realizing that that late morning in the mid-60s would follow us. Hand in hand with the drowned girl, who could have been one of us, not forgotten but lost still, lying forever on the sand. Tell me, did you have a name? Drowned girl was a destination, but it could not have been your name. 
That's, that's, that was so strange to remember that. Because I, 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 when I called it back, I, I remember that I was sort of traumatized by it. And then I, I guess I blanked it out, as, as my mother told me to, you know. Don't think about it. Don't go near there. Um, anyway, um, in the new book, I have a couple of poems still about the heart surgery experience. So I'll, I'll read you these. I mean, some of these turned out to be a little bit more spiritual and, and mystical, as my, my friend Bruce Bennett calls them. Um, this one's called The Wandering Eye. After my death, my body was re-inhabited, but it was some other me singing through the regenerated heart. My blood had traveled across continents and returned with unrecognizable dream colors. I found new definitions for each hour's reflected light. I was thrown against shorelines and under skies gasping for a new language. After my death, my body was re-inhabited, and whomever awoke was not me, but someone frantically swimming, swimming, where there is no sea, only a transparent soul, and winds that must fill in the absences, and find the missing self, and reclaim, reclaim, reclaim. Now that was, that is such a weird experience. You know, I was in a semi-coma for about four days after this surgery, and my brother thought I had brain damage, and all, you know, all this stuff, but, but, you know, I, I came back and I, I, I feel like I've, I'm recovering some of the memories of, of that coma. And it's ghosts coming up and, and strange colors and just memories that, that probably couldn't really be memories, but somehow they are. I think the body remembers some of this stuff. This, this is one more about the heart surgery experience that I wrote well after, after the event. This is called Beyond Recovery. Exile from self tied to ascent and return. That late spring morning when I looked toward my impending assault as a gift. The magic of coma, pain, blood, violation, healing. Then the thunder of wild force and resurrection. My arrival back did not hold the weight of water, but storm, flood, fire. As I sat trying to recognize my body, my mind, my ghost-like figure in the invisible light, I knew the past had flown and that life before was a stranger to the coming months and years. In exile, the spirit is electric and in hibernation all at once. A finely tuned apparition awaiting once again the code tied to galactic, to galactic memory. Yeah, I, I definitely went on a trip during, <laughs> during that. <laughs> during that experience. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to come back and, and bring these poems to you. Um, I wrote this one for my friend Barbara Mink, who is a painter, and there she is. <laughs> uh, she's, she's a good friend, and, and she's a wonderful painter, and it, I just started thinking about how much emotion painting can call up, and, and so I wrote this poem and dedicated it to her. Painting for Barbara Mink. If I knew how to paint, my colors would be deep blue. There would be a moon, a shy moon, covered by translucent clouds. Perhaps a jet would be threading the night sky. There would be a soul represented as starscape. It would be a dream inside a memory. It would be framed in ocean waves, and perhaps someone drowning in sorrow, blind to strokes of light. Okay. Uh, this is another one I wrote about my mom. It's called Crossing Over. This is, this is more about her death. You know, she, she, she thought she was having headaches, and she went to a, a chiropractor, and he thought he, she was just having neck problems, right? And we finally found out she had cancer that had already metastasized, and she died two months later. So she didn't have much time between diagnosis and, and leaving us. Um, but she kept saying, I'm not afraid of death. She was a Catholic, a, a lapsed Catholic. She said, I don't believe in hell like my mother did. So um, this is a poem I wrote about her, Crossing Over. She made the crossing into a pilgrimage and accepted her going as a matter of emptying days. As she receded, she tried to make notes, but the poison cells weakened her body. She made the crossing with patience and few words. 
Let me go, let me go, let me go. I am on a very gentle glide from this disappointing life, said the dreamer, my mother, as she made the crossing and never looked back at us who wait. So those are the mother poems. Um, I wrote this poem and dedicated it to my friend Jean Mackin. Where's Jean Mackin? She's over there. <laughs> uh, Jean writes historical fiction and um, so I just started thinking about somebody who writes historical fiction, keeping the world going and keeping our stories alive. And so this is called Abundant Shadow for Jean Mackin. You already speak the language of the dead. You who arrived in darkness left before morning was fully awake. What you most remember, you remember intentionally. How the light fell just so, how November scent is with you still, smoke fires and burning leaves. You need not name the mirage, that silent stretch of road where illusions live, a prelude to what comes after, what comes again. Okay, let's see. You know, I'm going to read you this one, too. I, I, as I said, I was brought up on the beach, and I spent so much time in the water. And Of course, I had some mishaps and almost drowned a couple times and was constantly being bitten by jellyfish. And, you know, and I even saved a couple kids that, that got into the undertow. But I started thinking about this one episode where I was by myself. On the, my friends were way up on shore. And this is called A Day on the Beach. It's, it's equivalent to the drowning girl almost, but, but I didn't drown, so... But it's still a memory of almost drowning. It was very strange. A day at the beach. I am entranced as the seagull glides, not wordlessly, but masquerading as silence. The wave grabs me. I roll and roll granules of shore mud, seaweed, and foamy green glassy turbulence. I wrestle in the undertow, shivering and gasping for air to the safety of my beach towel on the hot August sand. I lie on my back, close my eyes, see an image of myself floating so freely like a slow motion somersault. Near drowning awakened something or someone who I was after the child had lived. So I will read two more. This, this one is in the current Healing Muse. You know, this, this whole heart surgery thing just made me feel like we're destined for certain places and you know, it's almost marked for us, so this is called unmarked. We had lost the map that would take us there. The stars and constellations grew weary of our aimlessness, our awe at their collisions and explosions. The path we eventually found needed no illumination. Even lost, our way was preordained. And I will, I will end with a light one. <laughs> Yeah, my version of a light one. No, th this, one's, this one's called Moving East to Ithaca. I, you know, this was such a strange world when I moved here 15 years ago. And these strange names I couldn't pronounce. And I immediately almost got, almost immediately got a job as an interim news director at WHCU. And I didn't know how to pronounce any of these words. It was, it was quite something the way they laughed at me behind my back. <laughs> but anyway, it was, it was a new experience coming to Ithaca from Southern California and via San Francisco where I lived for many years. And so I wrote this poem about it. I, I read this at the second, um, the second inaugural at the, at the Tompkins County Board of Supervisors. Um, moving east to Ithaca. When I first landed in the east after a childhood and most of my life along the California coast, I had never heard of storm windows. I had never heard the wiry electric buzz of cicadas. I thought the term down cellar sounded like it was missing a little grammar. I thought bluebirds were from fairy tales, not flashing like magic across the yard. I had never seen a wild turkey and thought I'd seen a strange, newly discovered dinosaur. <laughs> I had never seen or dreamed there could be a word like Taganic, a mysterious and mangled railroad track of impossible sounds. When I first landed in Ithaca, I had never lived in snow, never seen the magic crystal flakes floating like fairies from nowhere, had never experienced a real winter wonderland 
day after day after day. <laughs> I had never seen up close the bare bones of trees sprinkled in the landscape like a painting without color, only shadow. Never witnessed the small town feel of 1950s TV shows with firehouse fairs and chicken barbecues and generations who belong to a community where many never left. But I live here now, a kid from the edge of California who still dreams of coastal light and the smells of the sea and fog in the morning and still believes bluebirds are from fairy tales and snow magically falls from nowhere, and the bare bones of winter trees are the gifts of another life. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. I mean, it, it's fun to, to read for friendly faces. Um, I'm going to introduce our new poet laureate, and I'm so happy to say that it's Jack Hopper. Um, <laughs> I, I will read you a little bit about Jack. Jack Hopper is by profession a book editor while pursuing creative writing in many of its guises. He's long been into poetry and his verse has appeared in Parnassus Review, The Genre of Silence, Chronogram, and Literary Gazette. And he says his rejections are even more impressive. <laughs> He has three published collections of poetry, most recently Doubles, Poems, 1995 to 2012. He has also written and produced stage and radio plays and reported as a correspondent from Paris for jazz magazines like Metronome and Down, Downbeat. He's been in Ithaca residence since 2005. And I must say, I, I first met Jack a couple of years ago when I invited him on my radio show and when I became a real fan of his writing. It's, it, you're going to be in for a real treat. Um, it's my pleasure to present the 2015 Poet Laureate of Tompkins County, Jack Hoffer. Thank you. This first poem was called That Other Poet and is dedicated to Jack Gilbert, who is one of my, my particular favorites. He lived down the street from me in the Lower East Side many years ago, and somehow we never met, unfortunately, and now never will, because he's going to heaven. Anyway... That other poet. I had two of his books and a couple of things I'd torn from magazines. Not many, not much. The poems were as spare as his face, his trim beard. Some were so-so, trailing off. I'd begun to get cocky. But other poems, as though from Lesbos or Parnassus, began with their feet on a precipice leapt and paid no attention to the coins or tourists who tossed them into the deep water. The poet just swam ashore and climbed some height more challenging to try again his arc of words. This is a beach poem. Point of view. Even the soles of her feet are attractive as she jogs along the water's edge. When I squint again to see where she has gone, nothing is there, not even a print. <laughs> Anybody who's walked through uh, <laughs> Fall Creek, or specifically Lynn Street, will recognize portions of this next poem called Noises Off Stage. Half asleep, I hear what sounds like the flick of cards dealt to players. Half awake, I know my neighbor's flipping frisbees to a border collie who thinks he's herding sheep, <laughs> living frisbees on the asphalt drive. Other sounds of the city waking, a child shouting about a tree turned red within a green falls forest, a truck backing up, beeping, clicking heels, a woman waking whoever's sleeping. Morning again, the baby spot grows big and the lights come up on stage a single bed, a man swivels and drops his feet on to the floor. Same show, similar cast. We all keep coming back for more. It may just last. <laughs> this is called The Lion of March. Noise is off. <laughs> when I'm alone with no one else around, I admit that I'm an old man living in an even older house. 
I putter in the basement, run my hands over the nuts and bolts, screws and nails I've scattered on the crowded workbench. They are the alphabet of a language I never learned and won't try now, though I've had them for years, like good intentions. I vowed by fall I'd call a plumber to check the old boiler when suddenly it's winter. And as the cold persists, I pray that the heat will last, that the pipes will sing with their counterfeit spring, and the room stay warm, at least the one I sit in, for as long as I sit in it. <laughs> this is kind of a companion piece a friend of mine has suggested. If it is, it's the other side of a big coin. But anyway, it's called Mystery Play. We all get to a certain age where the people that we confided in are no longer there friends, parents, especially. And that's what this is more, this is how this begins. It's called Mystery Play. All the people I used to whine to are gone. <laughs> my wife, my mom, both walked, not ran to the nearest exit, leaving me here while the play up there goes on. How kind of friends who stayed, listened, assured me that this drama on the stage would pass, then upped and left, their seats beside me empty. Keep the resurrection, Lord, I need the rest. The questions we never thought to ask, the dead pile up. This happens to be a poem written in California last year about a cat that wouldn't go near anybody in the, in the uh, couple's house that I was staying at. But all of a sudden, Maya. Once feral feline hunkers three inches from my nose, Beneath a quilt I prop to make the cat a bunker. Horizontal, we're friends. At least she doesn't fear me. Till I slip out, stand up, start my morning exercise, colossal stride, windmilling arms. She runs away with skittish cries. In the air. Summer's gone. Labor Day behind us. Pools. The ocean soon will close to swimmers. A chill Pacific fog looms. Schools starting up. The snare and bass drum of a marching band boom and snap like an offshore wind. I watch two children seesawing. Wonder what we think, what he thinks with her up there. Will he, won't he let her down while she regards him as a clown? Tethered tension in the air on a fulcrum of the year about to change. This is based on a photograph that was sent to me. Well, you'll, you'll understand when I get to the end. Camouflage portrait. In the photograph, a young man in combat uniform stands tall, holding an M16 assault rifle, it, its muzzle pointed down. The gloved right hand holds the weapon's grip in a lethal blur, fault of movement on the, or the camera. The left hand's open palm cradles the barrel like an offering. He wears a helmet, goggles, and around his throat and chin a neckerchief or mask. He stares at the camera, his full mouth down at the edges, neither challenging nor friendly. Insignias announce paratrooper, ranger. On his knees, protective guards. Combat boots complete the portrait, except for the footwear showing under the bed. Flip-flops, sneakers, dress shoes, highly polished for inspections. All this in a camouflage uniform the camera was first to capture. And the message accompanying the photo, quote, ready for Syria, signed, your son. Oh. But he's coming home <laughs> from Afghanistan. The next one, true story. <laughs> Horns of Dilemma. My school friend Robin, classic scholar, pauses before the start of the hunt, one of the cloister's unicorn tapestries, to puzzle its inscriptions. Surprisingly to him, I help decipher words from Latin into English. He glances sideway at me, unsure, a smile, then with his open heart accepting what he never saw was the translation to the side of the painting where I'd read all that I needed. He was the same fellow who once announced with glee that I'd achieved a fugue on the guitar while drunk, a feat I never quite believed, but took his word. <laughs> Sir
symbiosis. When Mr. Hyde considers Dr. Jekyll, he is terrified. His animal nature allows him to smell his own fear. And he knows it's not just that stranger he beat with a cane or the leg of a table he gnawed that annoys the master. It's all those other events the doctor calls behaviors, acts that Mr. Hyde suspects the master takes some satisfaction in, or did until one morning he, Hyde, awoke with a terrible emptiness and saw the miscreant, Jekyll, escaping with all those odd behaviors in his hairy fists. Lifers. Cobwebs bring together this and that in the room. Dustbillies roam, but only when I do. To some, it's a mess, but they miss the connections that join the matters of domesticity and me. There are stretches of sheer blank space and then a painting. Music is invited in, the party's on, except for that stony wall of books thrown up against my indolence. Each year, my case for parole comes up. The warden is a kindly man. He smiles a lot, seems to like my humor. Yet, he warns, you have more time to go. So go. Get back to work. See you again next year. There have been a lot, of, a lot of films coming out in the last two years about the many, many wars we seem to never end. And uh, this is called Fury, the film. The Pershing tank is only one, a tin can tank against a panzer pride. It takes on all of them, its turret gun and fighting crew, mow down an enemy we believe is bad, will come to show more evil than we could imagine. Upstairs in the mirror, I see myself in a safe house that list serve neighbors warn may be a mark for burglars. I start to brush my teeth, grind furiously between beneath where all the bad stuff hides, get all of it, then drop back into the Pershing tank. Last survivor, just a boy of 10, when World War II came to the beginning of its never end. <coughs> this I'm saving for last. <laughs> Male Fantasy X. Its title before I changed it was Brooklyn Switchblade, which, which you'll see why. Under the ivy crowding our Brooklyn lawn, I found a switchblade knife. Tool or weapon would be robbers dropped, pursuing their swing shift life. I kept it, that thing I never would have bought, for reasons still unsure. Protection? To be a would-be Cyrano for all seasons? And turn back enemies at the bridge? I keep it in a bureau drawer. Hone, sometimes fondle, and snap it open. Parry, and as I end the refrain, thrust home, and enemies no more. I still have a... <laughs> this is about a place that doesn't exist anymore, but was very popular. It was an all-night diner in the Greenwich Village. And it was great because everybody would end up there. It was the only place left open. At the Jim Atkins Diner, 1961. Open all night in the village, haven in the liminal hour of the wolf to rovers, sanitation workers, refugees from parties over, bars now closed, casuals of the pre-dawn pre day, literary wannabes watering next to actors off from off-Broadway. We settled at the oval counter over eggs, burgers, buttered toast, and cups of quarterizing coffee. Cigarettes and forks moved most to mouths near numb with talk turned small as the hour. Smoke clung like incense over a couple's confessional. Laughter leaned its elbows on the vinyl. Or was it zinc? So long ago. We all went home, I think. <laughs> Digital birthday time. Even the clock is aging, and why not? Didn't we invent it, along with all the history we invest it with? Minutes ago, it was 753, the founding of Rome, and now the death of Charlemagne, 814. <laughs> older and older grows my enemy, only hours to 80. There is no tick-tock to a digital clock, only its red squint, in which to my aging eyes, a five is six. 
On Thanksgiving Day, when I was born, my mother, who'd no time for time, rendered thanks that it was done. I think of that childhood game, Red Rover, in which we all cross over, the young, the old, the halt, the lame. Approaching the end. Nine short tales. A dripping faucet ticks like a metronome in time with music on the radio till suddenly it's out of sync. Cut flowers upright for weeks, one morning wilt, nod off. Only the baby's breath survives the fellowship of death. He told me that he did it, told me that he snapped, a friend said. Strangled, he admitted, the thing he loved, now dead. The faucet drips no more. A plumber tries to fix its shattered, broken music scattered on the kitchen floor. She spoke of her funds for flossing till, I could see, till all I could see were her teeth. Even the hyena of lust I knew was there had vanished. <laughs> I've known you all my life, he mused to himself in bed. So glad we finally met. Then turn, turn, turned on the light and read. <laughs> they tell me that all animals are sad after making love. I'm still waiting for that to happen, the, the sadness, that is. <laughs> I'm frozen at my relay spot. Only the clock is racing. Soon the baton will pass to me, running for the stands to see. The illustrated poem hangs on the wall like an eye chart. Guests lean in, squint at it, smile, and turn away. <laughs> the last one of my favorites. <laughs> This is parking lot mem a moment, which you, perhaps some of you have heard before. He just sits there in the car, the radio on, with so much else to do. Out there, the eternal shopping congregation busily parking and moving in its pilgrim strides toward the new Jerusalem of food. The onion bagels will be gone, the last chad row filched. Bye-bye, blueberry pie. And the lines check out, the, pardon me, and the lines, the checkout lines, so long. But still he sits there, edgy, unable to tell if it's late Mozart or maybe Muzio Clementi, <laughs> that one sonata that he meant to buy. Yes, Clementi confirms the radio announcer. He turns off the ignition, steals his heart for what's in store, and shuffles with the others down the drive and through those doors that always open by themselves. <laughs> That's it. You mentioned you wrote five in the morning or something. Yeah. Like that. And, yeah. And Jack, to, my question to you is, do you have a time at which you write or do you catch No, it's all times. Like very often, very early in the morning, if it's, if it's spurred on by a dream, for example. But also fine tuned at night, very often too. Yeah. Do you ever use uh, tape recorders during the day just to say line into? No, but you know what? When I first started realizing I was going to start writing again and being asked to give readings, I started reading into my tape recorder yeah. just to see how things sounded and, and to get a, a feel for the verbal part of the poetry, which is you know the tradition. I keep little notebooks. Yeah, Everything goes in there. Yeah. <laughs> Throwaway lines, lines that. Will last forever, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do the same yeah, yeah. thing. I, have, I have, always have a little book with me in my purse, by my bed. You never know when a line's going to come. Every writer I've ever had on has said that. You know, these 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 things come from out of the blue, most of them, and we have no idea where most of it comes from. But we don't want to lose it because if you don't write it down immediately, you will lose it. You know. So the question to both of you is: Do you sit down when you know there's a poem? to appear on the page, or do you sit down and hope and wait that one will appear? Usually when I start a poem, it's been there for a long time. This sounds all, almost like rote, but it's, it's, it's very true. It's been building up like water in behind a dam, and all of a sudden it really breaks. It's that moment, and then reflected in a moment of tranquility, as Wordsworth would have put it. That, that's when the work begins, they say. But it's, it's worth getting that thing down and getting it right the first time. Then, then you don't throw it away. Yeah. A line will come to me, and then I sort of follow it. It's, it's almost like a cascading of color, water, feeling that turns into words. Mm. It usually starts with one line, and, and, and I know if it's not going to continue, then, then it's 
probably going to have to be put away. Because usually something starts following the one line. How many people in here are writers? Most of you? Hey. I know some of you, of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite part of the process? Some people really uh. like that, that beginning when you know where it's going and you're, it's exciting to follow it. And other people love going back and fine tuning it and, and shaping it and polishing it. Do either of you have a favorite part? I actually like it when it's finished, and I can say, no, seriously. Yeah, when I know it's true and complete and it makes sense, and then I read it out loud oftentimes to, my, you know, to myself or out loud when I'm by myself in the house. I, and then I go back to it and go, yes, God, it did work. This was really, oh, yeah. So I, I like it when it's done, because before it's done, it's kind of painful, some of it. Waking up the next morning and finding it's still good. Or thinking, there's, or thinking there's something in it maybe that should survive the bath water and the baby beam. <laughs> <All that. laughs> also, the transition from writing in longhand, which I happen to do. I do too. And then moving to the computer and actually typing it up. Not printing it out yet, though. There are all these stages. It's almost superstitious. <laughs> yeah, I write longhand, too. I, I, write on, I, I can't write on paper that's striped, that's lined. It has to be blind. And... I do print it out when I type it up because I mm. often do corrections and think, oh, mm. God, this doesn't look right, and this is going to be its final birth, you know, on, <laughs> on the page that I write. So I, 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 you know, I, I waste paper, you know. I mean, I'm, mm. I'm constantly printing things out and erasing things and changing stuff. Do you have any trouble with over-tinkering? Oh, yes. Well, you could tell us that. But by listening to it, I don't know. But sometimes, <laughs> I think I probably have overdone it a few times. And, and, kind of miss the point, yeah, occasionally. But usually, don't you usually know when you're done? I, I can usually mm. tell that this is a complete thing. I'm not a cynical, but I am a cynical about a poem's being done. In other words, no, right? <laughs> was, that, was it Valerie who said that a poem is never finished, it's only abandoned? Ah. And this, this is very true. Because uh -huh. I've, I've, things I was going to read today, I, I looked at yesterday and I started making changes. And I thought these were finished, you know? They, they're not, they're not. <laughs> You change the poem, then the poems change. Do you look back on your earlier work, and if you do, what do you think of it? That's a good question. Oh, boy, yeah. I had a little tiny chapbook published when I was in my early, probably, I don't know, mid-20s. And I look back on it, and it's pretty interesting. It's strident political stuff. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, a bit much. It, you know, in some ways it's not poetry, it's more narrative and, and political dialogue. But I, I like some of it. Some of it I could, I, I could sense this woman that came back and started writing again. But it, it, it seems juvenile, a lot of it, yeah. I had a friend years ago who said whenever he gets depressed, he, he goes to bed with his collected works. <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty slim, but <laughs> he would read them for half the night, perhaps, and wake up and say, I feel much better. <laughs> and I understand what he means. Uh, my, my younger stuff sometimes embarrasses me. But if I sit down and just start reading, I'm, I'm turning the pages suddenly. I'm a different. I'm a young, much younger man. This is much younger poetry, and it's okay. You know, hey, sometimes it even moves me. That surprises. But does it feel like a stranger wrote it though, in some ways? So oh, sometimes, mine, yeah, mine yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, I had an experience recently with writing a 12-line poem and realized that I was only two, two lines short from a sonnet, and it almost ruined it. I'm, I'm racking my brains, how do, I, how do I make this into a sonnet? And then I said, why? You know? <laughs> why? Yeah. I'm about 500 pages short of a novel. 